welcome. Thrilled to be in Brisbane, my first visit ever, although I've probably been to Australia 20 times. Why have I not been to this city before? Yeah, and you're pretty taken crazy. with Goma too. Crazy, crazy, wonderful. Um, yeah, I came in early uh, yesterday before my various events started. We had a screening of a film that I've made that's related to the book, uh, My Nazi Legacy, it's called. And I had breakfast with some friends in Melbourne, and I said, what should I do? And they said, go to Goma. And I spent a wonderful two or three hours there. It's an, um, really a world-class facility. I mean, it's an extraordinary gallery. So, I don't know about you, but I feel a bit nervous after that list of judges, the police commissioner. So, if either of us uh, got anything to confess, now would be the time. I, I, I don't feel nervous at all. Um, <laughs> I, I'm used to standing up. In my courts, uh, I, I, I work as a barrister. Uh, as I'm a professor at University of London, and I'm thrilled to be here at Griffiths as part of this event, launching Integrity 20. But I very often stand up in front of a panel of 21 judges. And if you can get through standing up in front of a panel like that, this audience... Water off a duck's back. Well, and we've got a wonderful audience, not just judges. We have people from all walks of life. Some have read your book. Some, mm. some are planning to buy it tonight. Some have heard about you and thought they'd come along and have a chat. So I want to start at the beginning. Sure. The impetus for East West Street was a lecture you were asked to deliver on the origins of international law. But there's quite a personal voyage behind that, isn't it? It, it's, a, it's basically two detective stories that are melded. So I, my day job is as a teacher at the university and as a barrister. And some of the cases that I do involve the worst acts of mass killing imaginable. Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Congo, uh, Chile, Argentina. I've seen some pretty terrible things. And so uh, the cases are premised on two topics often, crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals, and genocide, the destruction of groups. In the spring of 2010, out of the blue, I receive an email uh, inviting me to uh, give a public lecture on my work on crimes against humanity and genocide in a city today called Lviv. Uh, it is in the Ukraine. I had to look it up. Uh, and I accepted the invitation, not because I had a burning desire to fly to the Western Ukraine but, and give a lecture on that subject, but because my grandfather was born in the city that I was invited to when it was called Lemberg, uh, and after that it was called Lvov when it was part of Poland. This is a city that is remarkable. It's at the epicenter, a fault line of conflict. It was an incredibly multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious city uh, in the early 20th century, and all that was lost uh, as I discovered in accepting the invitation. Well, it wasn't only that your granddad w was born there. The two main characters in your book, Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin, also spent time there. Well, I mean, you couldn't in in really invent this story, actually. I mean, I knew nothing about what we're about to talk about and what some of you will have seen in the book. So I s over the summer of 2010... I prepare on the side from my other activities the lecture that I'm going to give on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity. And I discovered two things. First, the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law in the Nuremberg Statute in the summer of 1945, a man called Hirsch Lauterpacht, came from the same city and studied at the very same law school that had invited me. And the folks at the law school had no idea. It gets even more amazing because you jump to it straight away. The guy who invented the concept of genocide, also in 1945, they're both modern concepts, people are surprised about that. A uh, man called Raphael Lemkin, guess where he went to university? Absolutely, the same law school, and they didn't know about him either. So I'm thinking, how totally amazing. They've invited me to give this lecture, they have no idea uh, that they are the font for modern international criminal law, and I'm gonna talk about their own alumnus. And we'll go to those characters in just a moment. But at the centre of East West Street, you mentioned it, it's the issue of crimes against humanity and genocide. For those of us who aren't, aren't uh, judges, um, but these were developed side by side by those two pr protagonists that you've just referred to. Just explain those two terms again. And, and they're not new terms, are they? I thought they were. So, so if, I, if I was in my classroom at this point, I would point to someone who's probably a justice of the... Queensland Supreme Court or something, and say, OK, so what's the difference between crimes against humanity and genocide? And I suspect that most people in this room would look blankly at me and 
So uh, actually, I, I don't have a clue. And you, there's no reason you would have a clue. That, 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 that People have never really turned their minds to it. But the differences are absolutely crucial. And they touch each of us. Crimes Against Humanity was invented in 1945 by Lauter Pact to protect individuals, to say that the killing of individuals on a large scale, unlawfully, was a crime under international law, crime against humanity. Focus on protecting individuals. Lemkin said, no, 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 that's not the way to go. People don't get killed in large numbers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, because of their individual characteristics, but because they're members of a group. And so what the law must do is it must protect groups, cultural diversity and groups, and it must operate to protect them not as individuals, but as members of a group. Every genocide is a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity is a genocide. So is genocide harder to prove because there's that element of intention? The, that's absolutely right. The basic difference between the two is that to prove a crime against humanity, you've got to show that a large number of people have been killed systematically and unlawfully. To prove a genocide, you have to do that, but additionally, you have to prove that the acts of killing are motivated by an explicit desire to destroy the group. And basically, people don't go around leaving bits of paper saying, oh, I'm going to kill 100,000 people to destroy the group of which they are members. So it's a very difficult thing to prove. So the, the epicenter of this was the Nuremberg trials. Which of those prevailed? Was it, was it crimes against humanity or was it genocide? Well... Um, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll come on maybe to the fourth man in the story. Is this a moment to mention the fourth man in the story? Or okay, we can or, go to the characters, be, yeah. Because sure. just in terms of the process of what this leads to. So here I am. I turn up in Lviv in 2010. I invite my mum. I invite my aunt. I bring my 15-year-old son because it's sort of going to find my grandfather's house type of you know, family. Who, are, who, who am I T type of adventure? And uh, have done my research on Lauter Pact and Lemkin, begin to get curious about them. And as I return to the city, as I've done every year, once or twice ever since, a fourth man comes into the story. His name is Hans Frank. Hans Frank was Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer. You cannot get closer to the epicenter of horror than that. The Butcher of Warsaw. The Butcher of Warsaw, 1928 to 1932, he does all the criminal defense case for the Nazis and Hitler. 1933, Minister of Justice of Bavaria. 1939, um, appointed Governor General of Occupied Poland. Very cultured man, personal friend of Richard Strauss, absolutely connected to the epicenter of uh, power. And on his territory between 1941 and 1944-45 are all the concentration camps that we now uh, know infamously uh, about. And he... I learn, arrives in the city of Lviv, Lemberg, on the 1st of August 1942, comes to the university, comes to a building like this, an auditorium like this, and gives a speech in which he announces that in the next two weeks, all of the Jews of the city are going to be killed. And in the group of people who are swept up in the events of the next two weeks are Lauter Pack's entire family, his parents, brothers, sisters, aunties, cousins, everything, Lemkin's entire family, and my grandfather's entire family. So Frank becomes the point of connection. And that's almost impossible to, to, to conceive, isn't it? The, those connections. Uh, you know, so coming back to my own childhood, I grew up in a pretty happy household in London, uh, with my brother and I, and we knew that dark things had happened, but like many families, and it's not just out of Germany or Poland, but Cambodia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, it's the same, exactly the same scenarios. Um, there were certain no-go areas. My grandfather had escaped from Lvov when he was 10 years old. He went to Vienna, and in 1939, because he was Jewish, he had to leave uh, Vienna, and he went to Paris. We'll come back, I think, to some of these uh, stories of exactly what happened. I never knew, because he never once talked to me. He lived until 1997. We knew, my brother and I, don't talk about what happened before 1945. He doesn't want to talk about it. It's very painful for him, so just don't go there. So, so we never knew. What I didn't know was that he had left behind 80 members of his family in this city of Lviv and a neighboring town called Zhulkiev, which becomes quite important. 
and they were all alive in 1939. By 1945, he was the only one alive. And Lauterpacht and Lemkin had exactly the same experiences. So there's these points of connection. Well, and explain to us when they found out what had happened to their family. You, you couldn't invent it. Um, they're different men. Lauterpacht becomes an academic and a, eventually professor of uh, international law at Cambridge University. Uh, Lemkin becomes a public prosecutor. Uh, there are in this room academics and, and prosecutors and judges. Uh, they both go their own ways. In 1944-45, they are both recruited in the effort that will become the Nuremberg trial. Lauterpacht is recruited by the British to join the prosecution team at Nuremberg on crimes against humanity. Lemkin works famously with Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor uh, in the Nuremberg trial, pushing for genocide. Amongst the 22 men in the dock is Hans Frank, who has been caught in Bavaria. And Lauterpacht and Lemkin prosecute Hans Frank. When the trial opens on the 20th of November 1945, they do not know that the man they are prosecuting has, is responsible for the deaths of their entire families. They still hope that their families are still alive. There's no information. They only discover in the summer of 46, as the trial comes to an end, that the man they're prosecuting is responsible. They're prosecuting him for the murder of their own families. For the lawyers in the audience, it, and for me, the moment I learn that someone I'm involved with in a case, prosecuting or in a case against, uh, has a personal connection to my family, I'm out of the case, you just withdraw it. That, that was a different age. And they batted on in circumstances that are, I think, just impossible to imagine. And they're quite different men. Just tell us a little bit about them individually and perhaps their motivations. Totally different men. Um, Lauterpacht is the scholar and the establishment figure. Lemkin is a total loner. Um, and I find myself curiously sort of divided in my feelings between them. They're obviously both remarkable individuals. Uh, intellectually, I find myself closer to Lemkin, although right at the end, um, without giving a big reveal, I, 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 I sort of have a shift of direction towards the group and the tribalism thing. But, it, but, but it's plain that if I were to have to choose to have dinner with one of them, it would be Lemkin. He was a remarkable character, a, a pool of energy and source of information. And I suspect he'd be a much more entertaining dining and drinking companion. Entertaining, yes, certainly to have to the barbecue. But reading the book, I thought you had more respect for Lauterpacht. Intellectually. But would you always want to have dinner with the person you have more respect no. for intellectually? <laughs> no. no, no, no. Do we owe really. more to one of those le than another? Le le Lem Lemkin, well, I think we owe a lot to both. I mean, without both these men, we wouldn't now have these concepts that you all know of but have never understandably turned your minds to. Lemkin drove people crazy. He was a total obsessive and a total loner. Uh, and I address that in the book. And he just, he was completely obsessed with the concept of genocide to the point that when the judgment comes down, coming back to your early question, Madonna, uh, on the 1st of October 1946, exactly 70 years ago, I mean, the timing with, you know, age of insecurity, we have forgotten in my country, Britain, I have to say, where we came from uh, in relation to settlements of the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Union, and there's a, an unraveling of the settlement uh, that came. But when the judgment came down, it made not a single mention of the word genocide. Crimes Against Humanity was all over it. Genocide wasn't in it. And Lemkin described to an American prosecutor, King, that that day, the 1st of October 1946, was the worst day of his life. The blackest day of my life, he described it as. Worse even than I learnt that my mother and father and all my family perished. So it gives you an indication of the kind of individual uh, that he was. A very interesting, peculiar, special individual. And why wasn't genocide mentioned? Was it that it was too difficult to make that proof? Genocide was not mentioned for reasons that will resonate in the United Kingdom, United States, Australia. Genocide was not mentioned by the Brits because they were worried that the concept of genocide, the protection of groups, would be used against them in relation to colonialism and in relation to what had happened in Africa and parts of Asia and other parts of the world. That plainly resonates. The United States was worried about something more domestic, blacks and American Indians. And Southern senators basically lobbied Jackson 
to not include genocide. And indeed, uh, he didn't. The word never passed his lips. No American prosecutor used the word genocide at any point in the trial. So did Lemkin consider... What happened after that, the Nuremberg trials, that, that made him consider himself a success? Because in the verdict, genocide's not mentioned. Lauderpacht's got his way with the crimes against humanity. So Lemkin... Uh, uh, Lemkin was described by um, Ro Robert Jackson's son, Bill. Uh, I mean, the coincidences, which we'll come on to, are literally amazing. So, so Bill Jackson uh, is Lemkin's... Uh, it works with Lemkin and Lauterpacht, the son of Robert Jackson. He assists his father throughout the trial. He describes in one of the letters uh, Lemkin as a persistent bugger. And I was able to ask um, uh, Ro Bill, Bill Jackson's daughter... Uh, what her father meant when he referred to Lemkin as a persistent bugger, because by extraordinary coincidence, and I didn't know this at the time, my literary agent is called Melanie Jackson, and she's the daughter of Bill Jackson. Um, so I all of a sudden had access. Who could tell me exactly when her father used those form of words? What did he mean? He persisted. Within a month of the end of the trial, he had persuaded the UN General Assembly to adopt a resolution, Resolution 96, basically overturning the judgment, in this sense, saying genocide is a crime under international law. And within two years, he had persuaded the world to adopt what is the first modern binding human rights convention, the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And I think that underscores... The essential thesis of the book, it's not a scholarly book, it's not an academic book, it's a book about stories, and I'll come back onto that in a moment. Individuals really matter. Individuals with civil courage can make a real, real difference, and he and Lauterpacht both made a real difference. Have they been sufficiently acknowledged in history now, do you think? N I, neither of them were interested in being acknowledged in the sense of... You know, today in the sort of social media age, you achieve a minor accomplishment and you have to tweet it and Facebook it and tell the world how fantastic you are. This was a totally different age. These people were interested in substance, not in personalities. They were interested in achieving change that was enduring and well. I, I mean, the, 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 my favorite account of Lemkin, I, the, this book is not a dry legal book. I traced down all the people that I could find so one lady that I found, extraordinary lady in her 80s, called Nancy Steinson, um, was a student at Columbia University, an 18-year-old student at Columbia University in 1959. And she took a picnic with a friend of hers in uh, Riverside Park, which some of you will know, in Manhattan, close to Columbia. And as they were sitting there having a picnic, an elderly, very disheveled man came up to them and said to them, Hello, I can say I love you in 20 languages. And it was Raphael what Lemkin. Line. It was Raphael Lemkin, which says a lot about the individual. Nancy came to know Raphael Lemkin and became his research assistant. For, it was the last year of his life. He died of a heart attack at the end of that year and helped him write an unpublished memoir. And she describes him as a man who had literally no interest in self-promotion, no interest in his own well-being, all he cared about was the idea of genocide. So I feel as though even tonight that you've introduced us very well to Lata Pact and Lemkin. And just go back to Hans Frank. Any remorse at the end when he was on trial? A truly terrible and weak man. Um, he gets his day in court in April 1946 and he becomes the only defendant out of the 22 to express any remorse, but he couches it very, very carefully. He expresses a recognition of responsibility by collective guilt. He was part of the system. In other words, he accepts the guilt of the group, but not his own individual guilt. And that generates amongst the other defendants a sort of riotous negative reaction. They all come down on him. Dönitz, who was Hitler's successor, says no German should ever say that the group as a whole is guilty. He should have accepted his own individual responsibility, not that of the group. And they obviously came down on him, and three months later in August, when he gets his final statement in court, he retracts and says he should not have said that, and he takes it away. His son, an entirely different kettle of fish. So, as I've described, 
I was interested in the personalities. Uh, in researching Frank, I read, as I do when I do a case, everything I could find on the particular subject. And a book that I came across was written by uh, Nicholas Frank, Hans Frank's fifth child, born in 1939, grew up in occupied Poland in the Wawel Castle in Krakow, in case anyone uh, has been there. And in 1987, uh, as he approached his 50s, wrote a book that was published in Germany to great controversy called Der Vater, The Father, uh, published in English as In the Shadow of the Reich. It is, I read it in a single weekend, unputdownable, a vicious attack by a child on his father. He, the first time I met him, I reached out to him, I wanted to know more, I wanted to see the father's diaries, the correspondence. He, I meet him and two things happen. First, he says to me, Philippe, you need to understand I'm totally against the death penalty except in the case of my father which is pretty amazing. And then he whips out his wallet and says, look, look, and takes a photograph out of his wallet, and he walks around with a picture, a photograph, of his father's dead body to say, every day I have to remind myself that he is well and truly dead. He detests his father. And it is troubling. Uh, and yet I have come to be rather close to him and yeah, to respect him. He's my friend, and he's a remarkable man. He's a very distinguished journalist. Uh, he was the foreign editor of Stern magazine, uh, and he really is on a campaign, really he calls it a civil courage campaign, to try to explain to the world how a weak man like his father um, could do what he did. And, I mean, the things that his father... To give you an illustration of the kind, the, the kind of family dynamic he grew up in. So... In January 1942, the Wannsee Conference adopts the decision on the final solution and Frank and his team, bless him, offer the territory of Poland to carry out the final solution, literally, at the Wannsee Conference. Three months later, Hans Frank's childhood sweetheart, Lili Grau, gets in touch to say, Minister Frank, Minister Frank, can you please help me? We haven't been in touch for 20 years, but my son is lost on the Eastern Front. Can you help me? find my son. Um, Frank goes to visit her, falls in love with her again in the summer of 42, and decides he wants a divorce. He writes this down in letters that I've seen. His wife keeps a diary. She records it. And he comes up, for those of you who are ever thinking of getting a divorce, with truly the worst and most disgraceful justification for a divorce I've ever come across. He says to his wife, I am about to become involved in something that is so terrible that it would be better for you to distance yourself from me and grant me the divorce that I want. Her she says no. Is quite telling. She says no. She says no. I would rather be married to a mass murderer than be divorced and without power. She writes to Adolf Hitler personally, sends a photograph of her and the five children to the Fuhrer who calls Frank and says, you will not get divorced until the end of the war. You will stay with your wife because it will undermine morale. And he follows Hitler. So, you know, these kinds of personal stories, why are they relevant? They give us an indication of the kinds of people that we are truly dealing with in a way that the history books and certainly law books never really explain. And such good people in your book too. And my favourite is... is yeah. doesn't have a huge role, yeah. well, it does with you being here tonight, but mm. tell us, who is Elsie Tilney? So it, this is a book about, ostensibly about four men. It's a memoir about four men, really. But actually, the many of the most important characters are women, and it's a theme that runs through the book. For example, the three finest journalists at Nuremberg, and I've read pretty much everything, were women. Rebecca West... Martha Gilhorn, and Janet Flanner, who is now not well-known, but was the correspondent for The New Yorker in Europe. Remarkable writings, able to capture what went on in the courtroom in a way that the men journalists simply could not do. Well, Rebecca West had a bit of help. Rebecca West was having an affair with the American judge, Biddle, who was her secret source of information. I mean, basically... Everyone was having sex with, either. you know, the things that were going on um, in, in behind the scenes. And I should say that in big international criminal trials today, it's not so different. Um, <laughs> so we won't open that door. But, but, but on the theme of women, so 
I've told you a bit about the, the big political story and the legal story, crimes against humanity and genocide, but in parallel, I've got another detective story that I'm undertaking, which is what happened to my family in 1939. I had assumed that they had left together. This was something my mother would never talk about and my grandfather would not talk about, that they had left Vienna in early 1939 after the Nazis took over in Austria. It turned out that didn't happen. They left separately. Just to give you a little bit of timing so you get a sense of it, my grandparents marry in May 37. My mother is born in July 38. Then in January 39, my grandfather leaves by himself. The first question I need to address in exploring, researching the book is, why did he leave by himself? What happened? What father leaves behind a wife and a one-year-old, a six-month-old child? I've learned you don't ever judge. You don't know what exactly the circumstances were. So my style is just to lay out the material. You are intelligent readers. You will form your own view. Six months later, my mother travels by herself, aged one, from Vienna to Paris. So work that out. How did she get there? Before I went to Lviv in 2010, I asked my mother, expecting the answer to be no, did my grandfather leave any papers behind? And she comes to her living room with two big briefcases, full, full of material. Amongst the passports, photographs, expulsion orders, certificates, stuff that one finds in life, I find a tiny piece of paper, one inch by one inch, yellow, written in pencil in a very angular writing, Miss E. M. Tilney, Manuka, Bluebell Road, Norwich, Angleterre. And I say to my mum, who, who is Miss Tilney? She says, I don't know. I said, no, come on. She says, I don't know. Now, well, why, why has he kept this piece of paper for 70 years? There must be a reason. She says, well, okay. I think what it is, I think she's the lady who saved my life. And I said, and you didn't want to find out who she was? She said, no, but you do it. So I spend four years working out who is Miss E. M. Tilney. And it turns out that I, I owe my existence to Miss Elsie Tilney of Norwich, England. Elsie Tilney was born in 1893. She was an evangelical Christian missionary associated with the Surrey Chapel in Norwich, which I have come to know, which still exists today. And they had a particular uh, interpretation of chapter 10, verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans, which in their version is expressed as to the Jew first. And she was told by her pastor, David Panton, that that imposed upon her a responsibility to save Jews and others who were persecuted by the Nazis wherever they could. And she devotes her life from 1935 to 1944 to saving people. And one of the people that she saved, having met my grandfather in Paris in early 1939, is my mum. She takes the train, she goes up to um, uh, Vienna, and she brings back my mother and gives my mother to uh, uh, my grandfather. And my mother is then hidden for the rest of the war. Of course, that left a, a further question a big question in my mother's life, which is why did her mother stay behind? Why did my grandmother not travel with her child? For any child and for any parent, it's counterintuitive. Again, I don't judge, I was not there, I do not know what the pressures were and the circumstances were. And so the next question I had to explore was why did my grandmother stay behind? Uh, and that question too, I managed to resolve. Do you want to know, tell us how? Let's just say that um, she had found someone else in her life. <laughs> so and I tracked down the person who's long since deceased, but I managed to find the person's granddaughter uh, and uncover a whole load of interesting material. But that, you, the thing in life that you understand is when you open one door, yeah. you enter a space and you think you've got to a resolution, but there are four more doors. And the next door was, well, hang on a second. She gets married in 37. She has a baby in 38. How can she possibly be having an affair by the end of 38? What on earth is going on? Was this painful for your mother, for you to go on this journey? So I'm very close to my mum, and I wanted to be very respectful, um, obviously, 
these are much more difficult things for her than I'm less directly involved, I'm distant, I'm trained professionally to deal with these kinds of things in a certain sense as a lawyer um, and as an academic. And I knew that um, the uncovering of what had happened would, would be delicate. She loves the Elsie Tilney story. She truly celebrates, as we all do. Elsie Tilney, now there are newspaper articles all over the world about Elsie Tilney. Interestingly, actually, the city of Norwich sort of wants to put a Florence Nightingale statue of Elsie Tilney up, but the Surrey Chapel is against idolatry and is against... <laughs> And all they want is a piece of paper on the wall of the Surrey Chapel saying, this is what Miss Tilney did from our community 70 years ago. And I'm totally with them. And, and um, the question of the relationship between my, my, mother, my grandmother and my grandfather is more delicate. I think my mum had a sense that something had happened. And, of course, it opened another door as to why my grandfather... Uh, had done what he had done, and it turned out that he too was involved with someone, but he was involved with someone in a way that I had not expected. Those doors just keep opening. Yeah. It's easy for you to say, look, I'm a lawyer and an academic, but this must have changed you as a person too, finding this. I think it has made me a much gentler person. Um, I think that, you know, as a litigator, you're quite harsh and tough, and you have to steel yourself... What I've done is I've immersed myself in a world I'd read about, I'd seen things of, but when you talk to people who were there, that incredible generation that is now dying out, um, of whom I've talked to many, as you, you'll see in the book, you get a sense that it was an age, I mean, it comes back to Charles's point, actually, that he made at the outset. You want to talk about real challenge. I mean, we, I live in a bed of roses compared to what those people went through. Yeah. And it has imposed on me, I think, a sense of humility that I have not had before and a sense of gentleness. Nothing is what it seems. Would I befriend the son of Hans Frank? If you had asked me 20 years ago, you know, why would I be friends with the bloke, the son of the bloke whose dad killed my grandfather's entire family? And no. four million others. He's be and four million others. He's become my friend. Would I give the time of day to an evangelical Christian missionary who I bumped into in the street? Probably not total transformation of perspectives. Nothing is what it seems in life. Do not treat people on the basis of what, on first sight, they appear to be. Life is much more complicated than that. So it is a part thriller, a part family history. Um, it's had really strong reviews. Are you now a lawyer or a writer? Uh, I mean, the heart of what I do is law. Law informs how I went about the writing of this book. I mean, you know, I have had a wonderful editor and I've, I've managed to shake off that terrible way that we're trained to write as lawyers. And I, would re I love lawyers. I am a lawyer. I sit as a judge part-time. So it's not, I'm not dissing all the lawyers in the, in the audience. It's that we, we are trained to exclude emotion, exclude the personal, strip things down to the basics, stay objective. And what I've been able to do in writing this book is, I think, with the help of a wonderful editor in New York, Victoria Wilson at Alfred Knopf, is sort of um, shake off those shackles that cause you as a lawyer to think in a particular way and enter a different way of writing. Influenced, I have to say, by some remarkable writers um, from, the, from the early part of the 20th century, Joseph Roth. I mean, it, it, I, begin, I begin with a quote uh, from Joseph Roth, who um, some of you may well have read. Um, and I thank Joseph Roth for the title in the book, because to bring together the personal and the professional, I should mention this. I studied international law at Cambridge. My first teacher of international law was a man called Elie Lauterpacht, who actually was the legal advisor to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Australia in the late 70s and 80s, just before he taught me. And he was Elie Hirsch Lauterpacht's only child. In doing the research, I discover, and, he, and Elie also got me my first job in, in 1984 at, at Cambridge University as a research fellow. And in doing the research, I learned that Hirsch Lauterpacht and my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother, Amalia, lived in the same small town of Zulkiev, just outside Lemberg. Not only that, I learn that 
they lived on the same street, East-West Street, as Joseph Roth calls it. So the first street my great-grandmother walked on as a child was the same street as Herschelauter Pagd. To bookend the story, the last street my great-grandmother walked down on the 23rd of September 1942 was called Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven. Himmelfahrtstrasse linked the railway platform at the station of Treblinka to the gas chambers, about 200 meters. She walked down that street on that date, I discovered, along with, interestingly, the three sisters of Sigmund Freud, all of whom were gassed in Treblinka in September 1942. Two weeks later, Bella and Joseph Lemkin, the parents of Raphael Lemkin, walked down the same street. So you literally couldn't invent you know, the thing that I discovered, that not only is my professional life connected to the ideas of these two men, but I discover over six years that geographically there are these connections that I could not possibly have imagined. We've also got some writers in the audience, and you've written other books, Torture Team, Lawless World. How do you go about writing? Do you get up and sit in your pyjamas all day? Do you, do you get dressed, go yep. down and do it for five hours? and have, Just take us through the process, because this was a long, long process, wasn't it? Seven years. And I had, you know, cases to do, including, very proud to say, I did in that entire period of writing the book, the case for Australia against Japan on whaling. Uh, I was one of the two lead counsel for Australia. We'll very that, very privileged to do that. Um, and I've come to know, not through that, but through friends and other things, Australia very well. So I'm a very early morning person. I am most productive first thing in the morning, sort of six till the world wakes up, eight, nine o'clock. And that's when I actually like to write. But I had to do a lot of research. I've had to digest huge amounts of information and I've had to then write it out. I think the, there was something like 37 drafts of the whole book. And interestingly, to give you an, an illustration of how the process works, I'd finished a first draft by 2012, and then the point came for my agents in Britain, wonderful Jill Coleridge, and in America, wonderful Melanie Jackson, to sell the book. And Melanie said, I know exactly who the person is. Her name is Victoria Wilson. She says, Alfred Knopf, who are basically the most famous publishers in America. And I'm going to send her the the draft manuscript that you've written, I, it was sent off to her. A month later, I was summoned to New York. And Vicky said, I'm going to buy this book, but you're going to have to change it completely. <laughs> it was already 125,000 words. And here's what I had done. I, I had these four lives. And I started in 1914, and I intermingled from the beginning the four lives, so that you'd have two or three pages on Leon, two or three pages on Lauterpack, two or three pages. Vicky said, no, that, that, that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work, you've got a lot of information about four different people. The human brain can't cope with the journeys between the different people and the interweaving. Here's how you're going to do it. You will first deal with Leon from 1914 to the opening day of the Nuremberg trial. You'll then deal the same with Lauterpacht, then the same with Lemkin, then the same with Frank. And that'll be essentially the first part of the book, the first two-thirds of the book. And then the rest of the book will be the Nuremberg trial. And by then, the reader will understand who the characters are, and they will be able, they'll be in a position to, um, to, to deal with the interweaving that then happens during the trial. And she was so right. And I learned so much from that about trying to put yourself in the position of the reader, trying to digest information. And it's so lovely to have such a high-profile author credit the, the uh, editor. I really mean, lovely. an extraordinary experience. And she's a real editor, someone who takes an individual page and marks it up with 15 or 20. Um, you know, as, as legal writers, we don't get any editing. I've come to understand legal writing is really of a different, and I'm afraid, lesser quality in terms of the thought that goes into it. I have to say, though, in a sense, it's a bit like litigating a case. Uh, when you're litigating an educational, international case, you're telling a story. Yeah. Your audience are the judges, and you've got to persuade them of a yes. particular narrative. Even the language you use is different, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to come to your questions. One last question. You, you mentioned the whaling 
trial. Just tell us about that. How did you get involved in that and what was the verdict? So why am I in Australia, you might ask? The fact is I'm curiously close to Australia. I know Australia very, very well. Um, I had a wonderful lunch today with some of the justices of the Queensland Court and I, and, and I explained, so I apologise for those who were there for repeating it, but it's something that has touched me very much. I was a young international lawyer in, uh, in England. I was teaching by then at London University uh, in 1990 when a new person was appointed, actually, you know, same chair as Herschel Outerpacht at Cambridge University, sort of Australian connection, a man called James Crawford. Some of you will have come across James Crawford. Uh, he's probably the finest international lawyer of our age today. And he was appointed to a chair at Cambridge. So in comes this bloke from Adelaide who's not interested in sort of up their own ass, sorry for the language type, English people who are into hierarchy and establishment. And the, so in comes this sort of breath of fresh air. This person who can talk about anything, talks openly, calls a spade a spade, and we were like, wow, this guy's really interesting. He's a fantastic human being. And he becomes my closest colleague. Um, we do a lot of academic work together. We found a chambers together, Matrix Chambers, which became very famous because Tony Blair's wife was one of our, our co-founders, Cherie Blair, Cherie Booth. Um, and then we started litigating cases together. Uh, and uh, James was a huge influence. And when he was retained um, by Stephen Gagler and um, Bill Campbell at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, he said, I want to do the case, but I want to do it with Philippe. And the reason that he brought me in was that uh, in my other job, I major on international environmental law. I wrote the first textbook on international environmental law. I've always been very big on the environment. He said, I want to do it with Philippe. And so we did it together, and with our colleague Laurence Boisson de Chazon, with a wonderful, wonderful group of young lawyers at the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and, 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 and Trade out of Canberra. And I cite the case as one of two professional highlights in my life. The first was the Pinochet case, which was an extraordinary case to be associated with, a landmark case, because it was the first case that basically said a former head of state is not entitled to immunity from the jurisdiction of a national court, when he or she has committed international crimes. That had never been decided before. Very revolutionary moment. And the second case is the Whaling case, because it's the first time in history that the international court, or any international court, has taken scientific evidence in a real and proper way and used it to um, basically come to a judgment. And the real credit, I want to do this, is give credit to the Solicitor General who replaced Stephen Gagler, um, which is Justin Gleeson, because the case in the end, now the case is always won or lost by the performance of a team, but if any of you are interested in that case, go onto the website of the court, look at the oral arguments on the afternoon of the 3rd of July 2014 and watch the video and watch the 30-minute cross-examination by Justin Gleeson, an absolutely superb advocate, commercial advocate, not an international lawyer, a good thing, cross-examining Japan's expert witness, Dr. Lars Wallow. He destroyed him in 30 minutes. It's probably the finest cross-examination I have ever seen. And he won the case as part of a team. We won it all together. But it was a case I think we all feel very, very um, privileged to have been involved in. And it was a very courageous thing of the then Australian government to do because everyone said, oh, you've got no hope. The ICJ is just a conservative old place. They'll never, Japan's a powerful country. And, and we were a little surprised by the judgment, but pretty happy with it.